In Fallout 3, we can find a plethora of references to the 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, most of which can be found at the Museum of History. The site has seen better days for sure, as deep within the museum's halls, we mainly find destruction patrolled by ghouls. Still, within the offices, behind this very hard locked door, we can find my favorite of the Lincoln treasures. We can find the Action Abe action figure inside this room, complete with a samurai sword. While some NPCs like Abraham Washington will pay up to 20 caps for such a find, I still find it best to keep it at home and decorate my room with it. While unused in the game, Action Abe can be found in the files of Fallout New Vegas and can be spawned using console commands, meaning you can have Abe with you throughout the Mojave as well. What a time to be alive. I have always assumed this was a reference to the show Aqua Teen Hunger Force, specifically where Meatwad wants to join the circus and show off his talents in season one. Check out my new shape. It's a little weird, but I think you're gonna like it. <laughs> Samurai Lincoln, what are you smoking? Ah, that's a fine Wayne Gretzky. Whatever the case may be, Action Abe, or Samurai Lincoln, is a must-have for rare item hunters as I am quite positive it is the rarest toy in Fallout 3. Thank you to Ted from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 2, our quest for the Gek will lead us to Vault City, a gated authoritarian settlement outside of Vault 8 that used the Gek device once leaving their vault to form their own version of paradise. Outside, alcohol and Kims are strictly prohibited inside of the city. Because of this, the taverns around town serve synthetic drinks. At the parlor room in Vault City, we can partake in some Alcohol Z, which has some amusing side effects. There is no inventory item for Alcohol Z. When purchased, the drink is consumed, but it is connected to an unmarked quest called Drink Your Weight in Alcohol Z. This requires the chosen one to drink 100 bottles of the synthetic liquor, which will open up a fourth wall breaking dialogue option. Depending on our luck stat, the bartender will ask if the chosen one is okay, in which we can reply, no, no, I feel great. I'm just going to pop out of dialogue for a second and check my max hit points. This is how Fallout 2 directs us to check our character sheet after doing this, with the higher luck builds getting a boost to their max HP and lower luck characters getting a debuff. This is just one of the many fun ways Fallout 2 breaks the fourth wall, and it's always nice to come across them in-game. In Fallout 3, we are thrust into a wasteland filled with horrors around every corner. Something as simple as a bottle of water can seem like a timeless treasure. Still, wanderers should check the liquids they decide to drain into their bellies. Towards the end of the main quest, we will get an audience with the president of the Enclave, John Henry Eden. President Eden will propose that the Lone Wanderer take a vial of modified FEV to put into the water supply when starting Project Purity. Eden promises this concoction will purify the waste by eliminating mutants and ghouls, purging them from existence. Still, people like the Lone Wanderer will be immune to the FEV's effects. This, however, isn't exactly the case. If you choose to spike the water and you have broken steel installed, you will be able to find boxes of Aqua Pura out in the Capital Wasteland. If we drink it, the game will warn us that it will be fatal. Continuing consumption, the Lone Wanderer drops dead from the effects. This is terrific attention to detail that drives home the consequences of the choices we made at Project Purity. You mean, you don't want anything for it? I, I don't have any caps or anything. I can just have it? For free? Really? Thank you. You're the first person willing to actually give me any of that. Thank you to Baba Ganoush from the Discord server for pointing this one out. In Fallout 4, we travel to Far Harbor, an island with heavy fog and even heavier stories. The small port town is in constant fear of the local creatures that call the Foggy Bog home and the other inhabitants of the island, the Children of Adam. Far Harbor is based on the real-world location of Bar Harbor in the state of Maine, and while the luxury and pristine beauty may be all but gone from the area by the events of Fallout 4, that doesn't mean we can't find remnants of its past littering the area. The shops around town still have pre-war trinkets for travelers that come through the port. These items feature the original name of the city, Bar Harbor. Though strangely, these items misspell the state of Maine, leaving the E off for whatever reason. Perhaps in the Fallout universe, Maine was spelled this way, though it is more likely it was a flub from one of the game devs. I do think it would be pretty hard not to notice such a glaring error though. 
The Fallout world has many towns that simply change their name based on damaged signs, but we rarely find evidence of their past. These items are perfect for nostalgic wasteland wanderers who may just have a case of the old world blues. Are you enjoying watching this TKS Mantis Fallout fact video? Do you want to support the channel more directly? Want to find out where your father went all those years ago? If you answered yes to any of these questions, consider checking out the Mantis merch shop through the link in the description or the shelf below the video. Also, I'm sure your dad will come back eventually. With such a wide variety of options, you will be sure to become the next fashion icon amongst your friends. So what are you waiting for? Check the link below to get your Mantis merch now and become the man your neighbors want to be and their wives don't want to leave. And again, sorry about your dad. Mantis merch, available for money. Thank you to Arctic Penguin and many others for suggesting this on the Discord server. In Fallout New Vegas, the first location the courier will land is Good Springs. Typically, the player would talk to the people around town and find out what they can do to help them start their Mojave journey. The settlement has a ton of skill checks, making it a fun way to test your early build in the game, but we can have some fun if we are more prepared. One of the things that can be easily overlooked in this area is a chemistry set inside Doc Mitchell's house that can be interacted with. If the courier has a high enough science skill, various chems or a handful of stim packs can be crafted, which is an excellent boost at any point in Fallout New Vegas. Inside the Good Springs store, Chet runs a tight ship. He is perhaps the least interested in getting into a gunfight with the Powder Gangers. Of course, there is a skill check to convince the shopkeep, but if you happen to have Chet's suggested amount of caps on you, you can offer that to him as well. New Vegas is filled with small details and alternate ways to approach quests like this, making it fun and interesting to try new ways to handle things in each playthrough. Now just hold on, I never voted to take on the Powder Gangers. That's a thousand cap investment you're talking about. That's more like it. The people can pick up their extra ammo and leather armor when they're ready. Was there anything else? In Fallout 4, one of the best companions to have is Dogmeat, the German Shepherd we find at the Red Rocket gas station just outside Sanctuary. Our canine companion is essential to the story, and Fallout 4 has a hilarious way with dealing with the player missing that first encounter with him. In order to progress the main quest, we have to find Nick Valentine and search for Kellogg. I learned while filming this video that if you haven't been to Diamond City before you head there with Nick, the door will be open, Piper won't be locked out like usual, she will instead already be in an argument with McDonough. Once inside Diamond City, we inform Nick about what happened at the vault, and he gets a raging clue to go check out Kellogg's house. After searching through the home, Nick will say he needs to bring his best man on the case, and what happens next is a pretty funny way to force the player to meet Dogmeat. Hmm, interesting brand. Won't lead us anywhere on its own, though. What? The great clockwork dick is stumped? It's synth, Detective Jackass. If you're gonna be that way, you might as well get the make and model right. Joking aside, I got an idea. I need to call someone in. A specialist. Who's this friend of yours, Nick? Worked with him a few times, but he only likes certain people. Got a feeling you'll get on, though. You'll meet soon enough. I'm gonna send out the signal. It's a special frequency, so you won't hear it, but he will. Okay, I called him. Let's wait outside. Get to work, dog meat. <laughs> if all I needed was a dog, why'd I bother saving you? Just consider getting me out of that vault of finders, V. Give dog meat a whiff of that cigar, see if he picks up the trail. In Fallout 2, the Chosen One is tasked with finding a Gek and then rescuing the Arroyo tribe from the Enclave oil rig, blowing it sky high on the way out, destroying the Enclave. The game allows you to continue to roam the wasteland after doing so, but that doesn't mean that this can last forever. 
In fact, Fallout 2 has a hard-coded time limit whether you complete the main quest or not. After 13 in-game years, on July 25th, 2254, Fallout 2 will abruptly stop, no matter what the player is doing, and it will show this in screen. Afterward, the player will be booted to the main menu. This was done due to coding restraints. At the time, the developers figured it was such a long time frame that no one would hit it unless they tried. Regardless, the Chosen One's journey must come to an end, even if it's the rarest screen in the entire game. In Fallout New Vegas, in the remains of Boulder City, we can find the Bighorn Saloon. The owner, Ike, sits behind the bar, hopeful of getting even one customer these days. NCR troopers that occupy the area are discouraged from going to Ike's saloon, so if the courier wears NCR gear when speaking with him, we can get some unique dialogue that puts this into perspective. Hello. Howdy, trooper. I thought the Bighorn was off limits to you guys, but who am I to complain? Customer's a customer. The workers here don't much like the military. After too many fights and broken noses, the NCR doesn't allow troops to spend time here. That doesn't stop a few people like yourself, of course. Don't worry, I won't say a word. In Fallout 4, when we encounter ladders, they usually lead to a new area with a loading screen or they are just a static decoration, with no real way to interact with them. Still, while in the Mechanist layer, we can find a ladder that seems to break this rule. Around the Robobrain area, we can find a ladder in front of some filing cabinets next to the brain storage room. Walking into this ladder will allow us to ascend it unlike any other in-game, as far as I know. Of course, if you know of any similar ladders in Fallout 4, hit the comments with their location. Strangely, this isn't a feature in the Fallout universe and it only shows up once in a Fallout 4 DLC. Still, for whatever reason, this seems to be the only climbable ladder in Fallout 4. Thank you to channel member Edgy and Azzy from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout New Vegas, we find Alpha Team from NCR's first recon at Camp McCarran. One of the more memorable group members is Corporal Betsy, a tough-talking sniper who has this to say if a male courier asks for a date. Never seen you around before. What do you want? Yeah, right. You're sniffing up the wrong skirt. Try me again when you're tall, blonde, and female. However, if we approach Betsy as a female, she has some somewhat spicy dialogue to share with us. Girl, you are some grade A poon. Anybody ever tell you that? Trust me, the alpha males are overrated. Plenty of them in the army. All they're good for is killing each other and taking smelly shits. Yeah? So what? I could take a bullet in the skull tomorrow. I haven't got time to take it slow and subtle. I see somebody I like, I go ahead and tell her. That's about the only thing that the horn dog males get right. In Fallout New Vegas at Black Mountain, we find the prison building, which holds Raul, a possible companion for the courier. Just outside his room, we can see this toy car, which at first glance doesn't seem like anything special. If we look through the terminal on the same table, we can see some logs from the ghoul prisoner that shed some light on this car. It belonged to a night kid named Cuddles, who was very persistent to Raul about getting it fixed, going as far as to bring gas to help with the project, a significant feat in the Fallout universe. Raul was either not interested in the project or couldn't fix the toy, which led to Cuddles attacking the ghoul and Tabitha killing the nightkin to save the only mechanic she had access to. After reading through these entries, the toy car will now be renamed Cuddles Toy Car, making it quite the unique item for hunters like myself. But that isn't the only one we can find. At the Long 15, we can find another Cuddles Toy Car, next to a standard variant. These are out of reach by normal means and would require no clipping to collect them, so we can count the one found at Black Mountain as a unique item. One man's failed project is another man's treasure. In Fallout New Vegas, we can find many great armor sets. However, one set to be used in Fallout 3 still exists in the game files, and it is a shame we aren't able to properly obtain it in New Vegas. The Enclave Shock Trooper armor looks identical to the Enclave Power armor that we see in Fallout 3, but can take more hits before it breaks, and the helmet has lower DR than its in-game counterpart. This would have been cool to find in New Vegas as a callback to Fallout 3. With the Enclave remnant still around, it could have been in the bunker, perhaps being studied by the West Coast chapter of this faction. I believe the advanced power armor, known as the Remnants armor in New Vegas, is far superior, and I'm glad that we have it in a more modern Fallout game. 
but this would have been an excellent addition to the power armor sets that we can find in the Mojave. Big thanks to Badaz Sasha from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout New Vegas, just on the cusp of the radiated Mesquite Mountains crater, we can find an overlooked, interesting two-story shack simply called Hell's Motel. One of the most noticeable things about this house on the edge of the crater is that we don't experience any radiation exposure on the inside, which is in contrast to the high amounts we receive just on the outside of the shack. Oh, and there's a dead ghoul on the ground. This is Dr. Rotson, and I assume he was killed by the crazed Mr. Handy here, which is a shame. We can see that Rotson was quite set up in his tiny home. Being a ghoul, the radiation and ferals outside would not pose a problem. He has a personal fungus farm outside and a distillery in the kitchen. This guy was set up for wasteland living. Around the house, we can find a few things like a star bottle cap, a weapon repair kit, and even a copy of the DC Journal of Internal Medicine. Inside the fridge, we can find some random irradiated food or drink, which is cool because this can create some ultra rare items that you won't find anywhere else, except for like maybe searchlight. Still, looting the doctor himself has a strange occurrence. When picking up the Wasteland Surgeon outfit and equipping it, and then moving to the effects tab, we can see it lists as Dr. Barrow's lab coat, who only appears in Fallout 3. This is likely because New Vegas was essentially built using a lot of assets from Fallout 3, per Bethesda, which would then be edited or changed to fit the Mojave as we can still find a ton of unused items from Fallout 3 in the game files for New Vegas. Hell's Motel may be a bit off the beaten path, but it's a fun stop during your journeys through the Mojave. In Fallout 4, one of the most fun experiences for some is building and decorating the settlements in the Commonwealth. Still, we can have some fun with items outside of this as well, and Fallout 4 is a little shy about it. First, holding down the interact button will grab whatever item you are looking at. While that could be pretty well known, maybe even rotating the object using the aim and the fire buttons you know as well, but you can also change the direction of the rotation by tapping the sprint button, making it easier to set things down the exact way you want them to be. Fallout 4 also has a built-in throw command. If you press and hold the reload button, it will charge up a throw, leading to some fun scenarios. Fallout 4 doesn't inform the player in a reliable way about some of these features, and they can be pretty helpful throughout the game. Thank you to Azzy from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout New Vegas, we can come across Lily Bowen, a delightful nightkin in Jacobstown that can be recruited as a companion. New Vegas is praised for the overabundance of spoken dialogue it has, and we can hear a rare line from Lily if we take her to Black Mountain. After speaking with Neil and getting the quest crazy crazy crazy, if we have Lily Willis when we meet with Tabitha, we can hear this unique dialogue regardless of how it all pans out. Tabitha, you naughty naughty girl, Leo remembers what you did. Thanks to Kevin the Dragon from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout New Vegas, while at Camp McCarran, we can find many things to get up to that will bolster our rep with the NCR. One overlooked NPC is Corporal William Farber, located in the mess hall inside the concourse at the pre-war airport. Helping him out will boost morale for the NCR through better meals, and we will be able to buy quite a nice bit of fresh food and water from Farber directly as well. We learn that he needs the food processor fixed, some spice to perk up the spirits, and a steady meat delivery. While there are a few ways to get these things done, you can pass a repair check for the food processor and speak with the Crimson Caravan to get a good meat run going with higher speech and barter. The only thing left is a little something to perk up the troops. This will take us to the infamous Vault 22, where we can find this food additive in the food processing area. Bringing this back to Farber will complete his unmarked quest and open an excellent selection in his inventory which is well worth it every time you are going for an NCR run. In Fallout New Vegas, while in Freeside, we can come across Mick and Ralph's, a humble store on the edge of town that deals with guns and general items. Mick and Ralph know how to deal and are pretty in tune with the rest of Freeside, so they are an excellent place to go to get some things moving when in the area. If we speak to Mick, we can find out that the Omirtas in Gamora on the Strip have no longer been buying weapons from the store, which is hurting business. So Mick asks you to keep an eye out, which can lead to one of the best rewards in the game, especially for unique item hunters. This will involve starting the How Little We Know quest, and the easiest way to favor Mick and Ralph here is to just side with Big Sal and Nero over Kachino and help the bosses with their plans. Afterward, we can convince Big Sal to start buying from Mick and Ralph again. When we return to the store, Mick will be happy to hear the news about the Omirtas and offer us a new and improved Pip-Boy. Oh, <laughs> 
The Pimp Boy 3 Billion. It's a pimped out version of the wrist device with a fancy coat of gold paint and shiny studs throughout the body. This is the only place we can get the Pimp Boy, and it is the only one we can find anywhere in the Fallout series, making this quite possibly one of the rarest items available, especially since the quest can be buggy, locking players out if they don't follow specific paths to a T. If for some reason you wanted the old model of Pimp Boy back around your wrist, all you would have to do is talk to Mick again to switch the device. Personally, I feel there is no better way to show off your wealth in the Mojave than wearing this beautiful piece during the rest of your playthrough. Hello Mantis viewers, it's me again, your silver voiced reminder to check out TKS Mantis on Instagram and Twitter for dank memes and big dreams. If you want to stay up to date with everything planned for the channel, such as future videos and projects, following Mantis on the social accounts listed in the description will fulfill your fantasies. You can now also listen to Mantis Sings Fallout on Spotify, Apple Music, and Amazon now. Support the channel and enjoy the rest of the video. In Fallout 4, while in Diamond City, one of the places we can visit is the All Faiths Chapel. This is a small gathering place for people of all faiths to relax and spend some time with whatever religion they subscribe to, hence the name. After entering the building and speaking with the pastor, if we sit down on the pew, we will receive the Quiet Reflection perk which will boost earned experience points by 5% for 8 in-game hours. The perk doesn't stack with Well Rested or Lover's Embrace, still it is a nice XP boost for just sitting down in the chapel, and it's always nice to have some quiet reflection. In Fallout 3, one of the rundown buildings we can come across is the Nuka-Cola plant. Filled with Protectrons and nasty Nuka Lurks, it's no surprise that we can find the remains of Winger Mercier here with a note on him that explains that he is looking for the Nuka Clear formula. Locating Milo helps here, as we can convince the robot that we are Brad Burton himself with a bit of speechcraft, allowing us administrative access and a copy of the research safe key. This key will open a safe in the research office that holds the coveted Nuka Clear formula. While this can be used in the Nuka Cola Challenge quest, we are looking at what happens when we go to the Red Racer factory after obtaining it. Mercier's friends will accost the Lone Wanderer and introduce themselves as Sudden Death Overtime a remnant of what they believe pre-war hockey players represent, with their names even referencing famous real-world athletes. Hold it right there! What are you doing here? Mercier didn't make it? Damn! How do they expect us to play when we don't even have enough people on our team? Well, as long as you brought the formula, I guess we're still in the game. The name's Goli Ledoux, and I'm captain of Sudden Death Overtime, the last of the ice gangs. There was a time where every city had their own ice gangs, and thousands would show up to watch them all duke it out in giant arenas. We aim to bring those days back. That's up to you. We can make a deal, or we can face off. I'm putting 250 caps up on the scoreboard. What do you say? Nicely played. And I know talent when I see it. Here you go. Okay, team. Let's get out of here. Stuff like this is what gives Fallout so much charm. The people of this world find things from the past and interpret them the only way they know how. This Raider gang thinking that all hockey teams used to meet in arenas and fight it out inspired their lifestyle. It's just a shame we couldn't get a unique hockey stick weapon out of this. In Fallout 4, one of the locations we can find is Thicket Excavations, a flooded quarry with one lone person trying to drain it, Sully Mathis. Approaching Sully, we can get the quest Pull the Plug, which has the sole survivor turn three valves underwater to fix the drainage pipes. Sully is hiding a little secret from the player though one we can find hints to along the way. No, what are you really up to here? Maybe I got some friends who like to go spelunking. Maybe I need a new hole to throw smart guys like you into. Are you gonna help or what? This isn't all though, as we can find a terminal inside this trailer with Sully's holotape journal inside, which also gives us some hints to his true nature. 
It isn't until after we drain the quarry and come back a few in-game days later that we get the whole picture. Sully leads a raider gang and they have made Thicket their new home. This is one of my favorite things to see in video games, the effects of your actions on locations and people like this as it opens up an entirely new area to explore. An interesting thing about this quarry after the draining, this is one of the locations that has an instant respawn on items, so after looting and fast traveling home to store what you have, the items in the area will have already respawned by the time you fast travel back. This is an excellent location for ammo and chems and a really cool way to show the player how they affect the world in Fallout 4. In Fallout New Vegas, when we reach the fort, the base of the Legion, we can meet many interesting characters. One of the more easily missed NPCs is Melody, an enslaved child inside the Brahmin pen. Understandably, Melody isn't too open to talking to the courier at first. Still, if we pass some checks in the conversation, she will confide in us that she is missing one of her only comforts, Sergeant Teddy. Talking to Antony, we can fight a few of his dogs in the arena for the bear, or we could simply pass a 50 barter check. The animal friend perk works here as well, though Antony will be disappointed. Now that we have Sergeant Teddy, we have a couple of choices. We can either give the bear to Melody, passing the quest and gaining karma, or, as is the topic of the video, do the meanest thing possible in Fallout New Vegas. In somewhat of a callback to Fallout 2, where the Chosen One could destroy Mr. Nixon doll found outside Vault City, the courier can tear apart the stuffed bear in front of Melody. This, of course, will result in negative karma, but a boost in Legion reputation. 100% worth it every playthrough. I don't want to talk to you! I hate you! Thank you to Azzy and Nokov from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In the Fallout 4 DLC, Nuka World, the sole survivor finds themselves in a brutal obstacle course thought up by the raiders that now call the theme park home. Various pitfalls await in the gauntlet, testing multiple skills that we have learned along the way. But one could make a dash through the course with a high lockpick skill. After the course, we will be greeted by Overboss Coulter, who is sporting a powered suit of power armor, which has electricity coursing through it from the old bumper car ride that has now become a Thunderdome. Porter Gage, a man that has been talking to the player every now and then through this whole ordeal, will hit the intercom to inform the sole survivor of his plan using a Nuka-Cola Thirst Zapper squirt gun against the electrified boss. Before we head into battle though, there is a door to the right that can't be accessed at this time, but we can enter through a hole in the back of the room and see a fusion core that's ready to be taken. Doing this will prompt Gage to inform us that it will help in the battle ahead. It's just a small detail that allows players to turn the tide a little more in their favor and it could be easily missed. Huh? Power to the arena is down by 30%. Not bad. In Fallout 2, there are many things that the developers were planning on including but ended up cutting from the final game for one reason or another. One of the most exciting pieces of cut content is the cut location known as the EPA. This multi-layered facility was set to hold a ton of objects and secrets that would have added some great experiences to Fallout 2. Killapse Restoration Project adds most of, if not all, the cut content back into Fallout 2, allowing us to explore the EPA and find the various items removed from the final vanilla game. One of the unique items we can see is a bag of Pop Rocks. The in-game description reads, An unopened bag of tasty carbonated candy made of sugar, lactose, more sugar, corn syrup, even more sugar, and flavoring. It is rumored that when mixed with Nuka-Cola, one's stomach would explode. This refers to the real-life urban legend that replaces Nuka-Cola with its real-life counterpart, Coca-Cola. And we can test this out in Fallout 2 to see if there's any truth to the rumor. Your life ends in the wasteland. In Fallout 4, new grenade mechanics were introduced to the series, allowing players to equip throwables and use them as secondary weapons without switching out of their primary weapons. This is a tremendous improvement on combat for the Fallout series. We can find a weapon in the game files for Fallout 4 that takes up the grenade slot but doesn't function like any other throwable in the game. 
the lucky rabbit's foot. The only way to get our hands on this beauty is through the use of console commands as it was cut from the final game, but having the charm equipped in your grenade slot will boost your earned XP by 10% and add 3 to your luck. The rabbit's foot unsurprisingly does no damage when thrown at an enemy and is really best used as a charm. It's fun to think about what the purpose of this foot really was as it was to be added to Fallout 4 through the Nuka World DLC. So I would love to hear what you think this could have been a reward for or where you think you could have been able to find it in the DLC down in the comments below. In Fallout New Vegas, we can find many unique items tucked away in the Mojave. Some have a practical use, and others you might just pick up because you feel it fits your personality. Even in terrible hellscapes like Black Mountain, filled with aggressive super mutants, large amounts of radiation, and Tabitha, the voice of Black Mountain Radio, even here we can find a unique item that rare item collectors will want for their home display. Inside the broadcast building, set up by a stand by some equipment, is the Sheet Music Book. While this item has no use in game and a value of 100, it is still the only sheet music book we can find in New Vegas, meaning that anyone who has a connection with music or just one of a kind finds will want to add this to their inventory. In Fallout 3, the capital wasteland is filled with pitfalls for wary travelers, whether it is the mutated life forms that call the area home or dastardly traps set by raiders, the post-war Washington DC area is far from safe. It would seem you can't even use the bathroom without a chance of getting caught up in one of these traps. This leads to possibly one of the most hidden dangers of Fallout 3, the electrical traps placed on some toilets we can find in the Capital Wasteland. We can find one here in the Museum of Technology, and this pulse can give quite a shock to any lone wanderers who may be a little too thirsty for their own good. Powered by microfusion cells, wires are then fed into the toilet bowl, sending a charge through the water and anyone who gets too close to it. These traps are helpful for getting a handful of microfusion cells for players who have the skill to grab them without being electrocuted, though the presence of these toilet traps will undoubtedly make you think twice before taking a refreshing drink or relieving yourself before inspecting the bathroom thoroughly. Thank you to Joe Splash from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout New Vegas, one of the factions we have to deal with is the Brotherhood of Steel, a now hermit group living in Hidden Valley. After helping the underground dwellers significantly, we will have the option to join the faction outright, which offers the Power Armor training perk, allowing the courier to wear power armor. This isn't the only place we can get this perk though. If we have done work with the Enclave Remnants, they will offer the same reward. This lets us know how to use power armor before getting the training from Elder McNamara, who will be pretty surprised about an outsider having this know-how. Would you like to tell me where you learned such a thing? No, don't bother. A person as well-traveled as yourself is bound to pick up all kinds of skills, I suppose. Luckily, that's not all I have for you. I've also given the order that all of our equipment be made available to you, not just the more mundane arms. You're a member of the Brotherhood now and your gear should reflect that. Lastly, you will be allowed to come and go as you please. You've done so much for us that to do otherwise would be a crime. I just ask that you keep the Brotherhood's interests at heart in all your dealings. Remember that you will always have a home here. This doesn't give us the option to tell the Brotherhood about the Enclave forces that still remain. Still, it is a cool, unique dialogue that can be triggered. Not all power armor in New Vegas requires this training though, as we can see with the NCR. We can find NCR salvaged power armor on heavy troopers. Even in the Ranger safe house, these armor sets do not require this perk because they no longer count as powered armor after being salvaged by the NCR. With the jury rigging perk, we can even repair these with sets of heavy armor that are more common, like metal armor. In Fallout 2, anytime the Chosen One returns to the den, they will see this world map which is an aerial map of real-world Phoenix, Arizona from 1885. It's here that we can choose how to enter the den, from the east or the west, but there is another option that Fallout 2 doesn't show us as it was ultimately cut from the final game. Pressing the number 3 on your keyboard when over this map will spawn the player in the cut den residential area. It holds a few houses, a bunch of generic NPCs, and even a copy of Smitty that we can't interact with. The plan was to use this area for a quest that would see Mom, from Mom's Diner, organize an orphanage in this area. The Chosen One would be tasked with clearing out a suitable building and helping the children along the way. This quest was included in Killap's Restoration Project, which adds a ton of cut content back into the game. 
so while this remote area in the original game is cool to visit, it's nice we have a chance to see what the final plan was with the restoration patch. There are a lot of things that were cut from Fallout 2, whether it be from time restraints or just the developers changing their minds, Fallout 2 is a goldmine of cut content for fans of the games to discover. Luckily, thanks to KillApp, we have the restoration patch, which includes pretty much every piece of cut content for Fallout 2. Playing through the upgrade often feels like you are playing a new game altogether, and some of this has to do with not only the new locations, but the items we find in them as well. The EPA, or Environmental Protection Agency, is likely my favorite of the cut maps from Fallout 2. It is a massive facility filled with mystery and exploration, still it has a rare item that we can only find here at the site. We can find preserved pre-war marijuana on the surface here, and a locker inside the storage shed. This isn't the only way to find the devil's lettuce here either, as if we travel to the violet level, we can interact with Mr. Kimmy, a large computer on this floor of the facility that has the ability to make various chems, and if we have a science skill above 100%, then we can request something special. Selecting marijuana, Mr. Kimmy will say he has all the ingredients to make it, allowing the chosen one to pick up some from the machine, an actual post-nuclear dispensary. Marijuana grants plus one luck and plus two charisma while debuffing perception by one per use. This lasts for 11 days, but you will lose an additional perception point after a week. The EPA would be ultimately cut from the final version of Fallout 2 due to time restraints. The team just didn't have the time to finish the area to their liking. Thus, the unique items only found here went with it, meaning the Chosen One wouldn't be passing any grass to Goris anytime soon. In Fallout New Vegas, one of the most ignored areas in the Mojave are the sewers that run underground across the Vegas area. Home to giant rats, ghouls, and aggressive humans, it makes sense so many people avoid the dank underbelly of the city. This doesn't mean that good things can't be found in the sewers, as if we locate Luke here in the central area, we can find a key known as Luke's Find. This key can also be found here in the east central sewers on Jill. The key will open the door to the sealed sewers, which leads to a chamber guarded by a large group of ghouls, but lying amongst them is a prospector that has exactly what we are looking for. The Humble Cudgel is a unique lead pipe with a decent damage boost. The pipe is in much better condition than its standard counterpart, and it features a T-split that almost mimics a hammer. The best part of this unique pipe is the special attack that comes with it, called Lights Out. You can perform this move by moving forward and doing a power attack, or by choosing it in vats. This will do 125% damage and has amazing results, so the cudgel is a must-have for any melee builds. In Fallout New Vegas, we can come across the Sunset Sarsaparilla headquarters. Guarded by Ol' Festus and a few Patectrons, this location acted as a bottling plant and operating facility for the pre-war drink. Still, after all these years, a beloved employee remains. Inside the maintenance closet, we can find Mr. Janitor. This Mr. Handy model was used to clean the building before the Great War, and he is still in remarkable condition. Hacking the average locked terminal on the other side of the room will allow us to start Mr. Janitor's routine. This can be quite rewarding for people who have the patience to let him finish his job. The robot will begin making rounds through the Sunset Sarsaparilla HQ, visiting rooms and cleaning up all that he can find. After his route is finished, he will stop at a garbage can and empty all he collected, wishing farewell to the rubbish. This being a bottling plant, most of what Mr. Janitor has picked up consists of caps, the currency of the wasteland. He will deposit a random amount of caps into the trash can, still, the number is usually decently high, so this is a great way to get a nice boost when you make it to this area, and Mr. Janitor is happy to do the heavy lifting for you. In Fallout New Vegas, the area around Vegas proper can be quite dangerous. Raiders, fiends, and various traps await any courier venturing off the beaten path. Just outside the Monte Carlo Suites, we can find one of the rarest explosive traps in New Vegas. On the road next to the Suites, this house has a mailbox unlike any other we can find in the Mojave. Notice the telltale spinning antenna protruding from the back. This, to my knowledge, is the only mailbox trap in New Vegas. If the courier gets too close, it will explode unless the proper skills are applied to disarm it. These types of mailbox traps were found in a few places in Fallout 3, but it is not something we see in New Vegas outside of this location. But if you have found any others, let me know in the comments below. In Fallout New Vegas, you may stumble across a pretty curious site when north of Good Springs. Chance's map, a crude depiction of the Mojave carved into the ground itself, could be something you have passed by. 
Sure, it's a marked location and the game will tell you that it's there, but after investigating it and taking the items you might want, the map doesn't seem to really hold much more of a purpose. To me, Chance's map is a memory, a celebration of one of the most disturbed great cons and his madness that led to his demise. We learn a bit more about Chance and the map in the All Roads graphic novel, which documents the lead up to Benny ambushing the courier. We see that Chance carved this map with his knife, which he later used to slaughter a whole gang of fiends at the nearby tribal village. After the battle, Chance would lose his life and the cons would carry on with Benny without him. All of these things are hinted at in-game as the tribal village, now infested with Cazadoras, sits at the bottom of an overlook that holds Chance's grave. Plundering the site will lead to finding Chance's knife, the blood of fiends still stained on the blade. So while some locations may just seem like a quirky post-apocalyptic set piece, remember that even the smallest places can have some of the biggest stories. In Fallout 4, the most significant settlement we can find is in the remnants of Fenway Park, Diamond City. Among the multitude of side quests we can find here, one can change 200 years of tradition if done improperly. Speaking with Abbott at the wall, we can start the quest Painting the Town. This involves heading to the old hardware store down the road and finding some paint for the wall. Once we get to Hardware Town, some raiders will launch a clever scheme to ambush the sole survivor, but after the attack, we can find some paint and a mixer in the rear of the room. Here, we can mix yellow and blue paint to make green, but we can also take these base colors back to Diamond City. Once we are back at the wall, use one of these colors to paint the wall with, and we will be confronted by Abbott. Hey, Abbott. Blue? You know what you're doing there? The wall ain't blue. I think it'll look good. Well, let's hope so. I guess it's better than her going into disrepair, but... Damn. That's over 200 years of tradition we're moving away from. There's your payment. Now get going. I got work to do. Returning to the wall a bit after doing the quest, we will see that Abbott has painted the entire thing to match whatever color we have used, blue or yellow. We can't use the blood can or the red paint added with the DLCs in the quest, so these are the only colors we can change the wall to. This is just an interesting small detail that people tend to miss due to using the correct paint during the quest. Still, if you want to change up Diamond City, this is one of the biggest ways to do it. Big thanks to Draker the Heartbreaker from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we can find Evergreen Mills, a rundown factory turned luxury raider hideout. If the Kimmed Out Raiders and Super Mutant Behemoth wasn't enough to ward you off, diving a bit deeper, we can find even more things that make this area unique. Evergreen houses three raiders that only appear in shacks outside the main factory. The Southern Shack, which lies just past the entrance to Evergreen proper, is home to a raider wielding a flamer. This is a unique model, and he has his own ID in the game files. The same is true for the Northern Shack on the opposite side of the factory. We find two raiders inside, with the female noticeably wearing the sexy sleepwear attire. We don't normally see raiders wearing this in the wasteland outside of this location. Inside the bazaar, there are a few entertainment areas. We can find a bar with a couple of stages set up towards the back. We can see what is presumably a stripper pole on stage, which would fit the area just fine. The scene gets darker when we notice the teddy bears and children's toys that litter the area. In the best case scenario, this is a scene of a weird act performed to entertain the raiders. Or worst case scenario, this would be the darkest area in a modern Fallout game just by the implication. But since no children can be found in the area and several underwear clad raiders seem to be taking care of business in the back rooms behind the site, I assume things just got weird with the raiders. So there's no better reason to send the whole place to hell each time you play Fallout 3. Thank you to Draker the Heartbreaker from the Discord server for pointing me in the right direction on this one. In Fallout 3, the decimated capital wasteland hosts many things to discover. Broken streets, shattered buildings, but every once in a while, something in the waste can still function the way it used to. The fire hydrants that stand guard on the once busy suburban sidewalks fit this bill perfectly. As in Fallout 3, these hydrants can be activated, which will cause the Lone Wanderer to drink from them, a task that doesn't make much sense considering what is needed to produce water from one of the pre-war devices. You would need a wrench or something similar and a working water supply. But this is a video game, so it can be overlooked as a fun source of HP at the cost of some rad levels. New Vegas, however, isn't buying into this idea. If we try to drink from the hydrants we find in the Mojave, the option will no longer be there. 
It's hard to say why the devs ultimately decided to cut this feature. Still, it could have been what I mentioned before, but the interaction just didn't make a whole lot of sense. So while you may be used to the flowing water of the capital hydrants, be wary in the Mojave. If you want a quick drink, a toilet would likely be a stronger candidate. In Fallout New Vegas, the Honest Hearts DLC will take us to Zion and introduce the conflict between the tribes that call the area home. We will also meet one of the most memorable characters in New Vegas, Joshua Graham. The burned man spends his time reading the Bible and preparing guns for his tribe. The Courier will have the option to side with Graham at the close of the DLC, which sees the Courier and Joshua mow through hostile tribals to secure Zion. Suppose the player asks Joshua Graham to use melee combat in this sequence. In that case, he will start using his trademark 45, A Light Shining in Darkness, as a melee weapon, smacking enemies with the butt of the gun. This is an actual in-game item called Joshua's Pistol Whip in 45. Through standard gameplay, the player can never obtain this weapon. Still on PC, we can add it to our inventory with the use of console commands. The Lights Out special attack does tremendous damage to anything in front of you when using this weapon. While it may not be the strongest melee weapon in the game, it is by far one of the most satisfying to use. In the Fallout 3 DLC Mothership Zeta, the Lone Wanderer is abducted by aliens and brought to their mothership. Friendships are formed, and with the help of other captives aboard the ship, we fight our way through the Zetan crew and uncover great stories along the way. Once all the generators are destroyed, we will be tasked with using the spacesuit to do a spacewalk to get to the ship's upper deck. While we can have some fun with unique deaths here by not wearing the spacesuit in decompressed areas, there is another fantastic animation that only plays here. If the Lone Wanderer strays too close to the ship's edge, we will see them float away in probably the most unique death animation in Fallout 3. Environmental experiences like this are always fun to see, and it would be great to have more things like this moving forward in the Fallout series. In Fallout New Vegas, Freeside is by far one of the most active areas. Being the gateway to Vegas, the area is home to many thugs and con artists, so naturally, people new to the city may want an escort through the rougher parts of town. One bodyguard that hangs around the north gate of Freeside has caught the attention of the Kings due to how many repeat customers he gets. The King will have the courier investigate this, still, there are ways we can disappoint the Elvis impersonator when dealing with Oris. First, if we take out Oris before speaking to the King, we can get some unique dialogue from the less than thrilled leader. So, it went down like that, huh? I guess it can't be helped now. Even though you lack subtlety, you've shown me you can get the job done. So maybe you can help me with something more important. Suppose we take the quest and hire Oris the way the King wants us to. In that case, we can ignore the bodyguard's instructions about the group of thugs, which leads to some unique dialogue from Oris. Howdy. Impressive work fighting off Benny's thugs. Huh. I guess they weren't harmless after all. I'm not often mistaken, you know. I know I wouldn't have survived that. Well, here we are. No worse for wear, are you? I trust that if you need to cross Freeside again, you'll know who to hire. Afterward, the King will be upset that we didn't find anything wrong with Oris and send us back out to hire him again, this time without covering the charge. What do you have for me? Oh, he did, did he? Well, that just ain't good enough. Get back out there and hire him again. Hire him a hundred times if that's what it takes. And before you ask, I'm not going to cover the cost this time. It's bad enough I'm giving the man more business. In Fallout New Vegas, the main quest ultimately leads to the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, with the main factions involved being the NCR and Caesar's Legion. Once this battle is complete, the story of New Vegas ends as well, and so does the gameplay, but this wasn't always going to be the case. Fallout New Vegas, at one point, had planned for the player to continue playing after the Battle of Hoover Dam. This is proved by the cut lines of dialogue that we can find in the game files. These bits reveal a bit of what the game world would have been like after the main faction's victory, and make us wonder what the scope of New Vegas would have been if a post-game section had been included. With the Legion defeated, things are great now. All those NCR troops should see me to celebrate. Come one, come all. I'm not letting the Legion make me a slave. Even I have standards. In 
intense fighting erupted on Hoover Dam as tensions between NCR and Caesar's Legion boiled over. Reports indicate that NCR forces emerged victorious and the Legion scattered amidst the defeat of its most feared military leader. Preliminary word is that Caesar's Legion has taken control of the dam and that the NCR presence in Nevada is severely crippled. While it initially appeared to be an NCR victory, we're receiving word that our own Mr. House may have been the one to secure the dam for himself. But in a shocking turn of events, the dam has been rendered useless, and both sides have taken heavy casualties. Neither faction appears to have won. But in a shocking turn of events, an army of Securitrons has seized control of the dam, preventing both sides from claiming it. Now, sources of the dam are telling us that the involvement of one key person appears to have heavily influenced the outcome. Welcome to Vegas, capital of the sixth state of the new California Republic. True to Kaiser. Thank you to Honda from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we can find a rather inconspicuous building housing a factory that produces the lovely Red Racer tricycles. The area is heavy with raiders, but those that push through will see that this factory is anything but dull. The best thing we can find here in the form of rarities is the giant teddy bear riding the massive trike hanging above the factory floor. This can be looted and, much like the other big bears in the game, will resort to a standard size if stacked. Going further into the offices, we can hear the same demonic whispers that can be heard at the Dunwich building, and any of the super mutants killed here will suddenly have their head explode upon death. This is the result of the surgeon, a mad scientist type at the end of this dungeon. We aren't focusing on his mission statement today, we are looking at the one-of-a-kind lab coat he is wearing that can be looted off of his corpse. It boasts a plus 10 to medicine and a plus 5 to science. Interestingly enough, if you wear the ghoul mask, the surgeon won't be hostile to you and you can interact with him and use the armor pickpocket trick to secure the lab coat in a different way. So many locations in Fallout seem normal at first and then get more cursed as you explore, and the Red Racer factory is a prime example of this. In Fallout New Vegas, one of the most happening spots is the Strip, which houses the major casinos we can visit and gamble at. One thing some players miss is the delightful audio easter egg that plays from the slot machines. When you increase your bet at one of the machines, the bass notes to a familiar tune will play. The melody is from the main menu music of Fallout 3 and has been used in most Fallout games since. In Fallout New Vegas, one of the casinos we can visit is The Tops. This is where Benny and his chairman can be found, so I'm sure most, if not all of you watching this video have been here at some point during your playthroughs. One area that many people miss due to no real quest objectives or loot being present is the rooftop courtyard that houses a swimming pool found by going through the equally less traveled diner or by going around the back of the main casino floor. This lush paradise is the perfect spot to relax after dealing with Benny or just after a long day of patrolling the Mojave. Still, many people miss this location entirely, and being tucked away out of the main loop doesn't help this much either. Make sure to get some sun and take a dip the next time you find yourself at the tops. Even a post-apocalyptic courier needs their break too. In Fallout 4, you have the choice to pick between Nate and Nora, a married couple living in Sanctuary that we join right before the bombs drop. Of course, you can change the appearance and names of these people, but that won't change the established backstory of both and we are going to take a quick look at Nate's past through things we can find in the game. During the resource wars, Nate served in the military and even saw action at Anchorage. We can see him walking with the 108th Infantry Regiment, 2nd Battalion, in the intro for Fallout 4. Scanning. Scanning. Accessing pre-war records. Record found. 108th Infantry Regiment, 2nd Battalion. Ahoy there. Tis providence a member of the Congressional Army is delivered to us in our hour of need. Many people believe that this is a callback to Fallout 3's Mothership Zeta DLC, where we can meet Elliot Turkorian, who was abducted while serving in Anchorage with the 108th Infantry Battalion. While the names are similar, this is no indication that Nate served with Elliot, as these are two different military groups. 
A regiment is an armed unit of troops under the command of an officer that hosts smaller units, while a battalion is a unit with two or more companies which reports to the HQ that forms the part of the regiment. This does mean that Nate and Elliot likely served simultaneously, which makes sense because of the Sino-American War. Still, it does not mean that they have met or spent any actual amount of time together. Before we can start customizing Nate, we can hear him and Nora talk about a speech that he's giving at the Veterans Hall tonight. War never changes. You're gonna knock him dead at the Veterans Hall tonight, hon. You think? Absolutely. Now get ready and stop hogging the mirror. Right. This is further referenced when we head to Fraternal Post 115, where we can find note of his speech using whatever name the player has chosen. While I believe Fallout 4 may be a bit lacking in the main quest department, I really enjoy finding callbacks and references to a backstory like this, especially when it's more subtle and we can fill in the blanks ourselves. In Fallout 3, there is much to do in the Capital Wasteland. Whether you are chasing down your runaway dad or just taking a stroll through the vast wasteland Washington DC has become, there is always something a wanderer can do to pass the time. One of the most useless interactions in the game comes from an object most people just run right past without thinking twice about it. We can find a good number of parking meters in Fallout 3, with the most residing at Jury Street Metro, and we can interact with all of them. Usually, these meters show an expired time tag, which all adds up since these haven't been appropriately used since before the war. Still, approaching the meters and interacting with them will start a timer and cause the machine to lower the expired tag. This is perhaps the most useless interaction in Fallout 3. Thank you to Avery from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In the Fallout New Vegas DLC, Dead Money, we end up at the Sierra Madre Casino and Resort, a place both filled with treasures and death. Still, it's home to a few rare items that can only be found within its resort walls. The Casa Madrid kitchen area holds one of these items, the pre-war steak, a cut of beef that has been preserved since before the Great War. A random amount of steaks will show up in the meat lockers in this area. Taking a look at them in our inventory, they don't quite live up to a good old Brahmin steak and even cause a negative one endurance debuff. Regardless, rare item collectors like myself, pun very much intended, will want to grab this meat anytime they play through dead money, only to leave it in the fridge of our player home, never to be seen again. Big thanks to Dr. Doctor from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we find the marvelous Tinpenny Tower, named after Alistair Tinpenny. He found the building in the wasteland and hired enough people to turn it into a community. One person not allowed in Tinpenny Tower is Roy Phillips, a ghoul. He wants entry into the elitist settlement, but is repeatedly denied. Tinpenny's guards wish the ghoul and his friends dealt with, but we can talk to Roy to get his side of the story. We can get rather unique dialogue through Roy that most players miss due to how the game is presented. Suppose we side with Roy and allow him to release feral ghouls into Tenpenny Tower before dealing with the bomb in Megaton. In that case, we can also side with Burke and rig the nuke to blow. When we return to Tenpenny Tower, we will see Roy and Burke form an unlikely friendship due to our choices. Look, Burke, I I don't care how you got past the others. I could, I could have you torn apart in an instant with a snap of my fingers. Is that so? Do it then, Phillips. Set your feral pets upon me. I could use a bit of sport. After I've dealt with them, I'll turn my attention to you. After all, you've destroyed my home, murdered my employer. I've got something of a score to settle, wouldn't you say? Hey, now come on. The old man got what he had coming. Look, maybe we can work something out. You said you just have some uh, business to conclude? Correct. You and your friends may have killed Tenpenny, but the man gave me a task, and I intend to complete it. There's a detonator on the balcony. When that switch is activated, the bomb at the center of Megaton goes boom. <laughs> that will conclude my business. Holy shit. You're gonna blow up Megaton? No lie. Look, Bert, if you're about to burn down that smooth skin shithole, I ain't gonna stop you. In fact, I... well, I think it's fair to say you'd be quite welcome around here. So what do you say? You do your thing and we let bygones be bygones. All right. 
Water under the bridge, then. Truth be told, I'm a, a firm believer in natural selection. What you people did here was inspired. All right, then, Burke. Uh, uh, Mr. Burke, I'll let you get to it. And, um, thanks for your uh, understanding. In Fallout 2, one of the first companions you are likely to meet is Solik, an angry tribal who was now being held at the Buckners in Klamath after busting up the bar. Solik came to town to find Vic the traitor to get information on his missing sister, but when Vic wasn't around, Solik lost his temper. Doing quests for the Buckners or outright paying for the damages will allow Solik to join your party. The two of you set off into the wasteland for the adventure ahead, but no matter how long you look, you will never find Solik's sister. The quest, along with the two locations that were related to the Umbra tribe, were cut from the final game. Growing up, I always thought there would be a way to rescue the tribal sibling, with the Slaver's Guild in the Den being my prime suspect, and it turns out I wasn't so wrong after all. As with Killap's restoration patch, we can not only visit the tribe, but we can also complete their quests. When speaking to Metzger, if the Chosen One has speech above 51%, we can find out that the slaver has a camp outside of town where all of the new captives are taken. If we promise him a premium price, Metzger will give us directions. Once at the camp, we can handle things peacefully or we can have some fun. There is also a way to storm the place with NCR rangers. After the smoke is cleared, we can find Karisu, Solik's sister, inside of a shelter in the north area of the map. Speaking with Karisu will reunite the siblings and eventually lead to the cell door being unlocked, freeing all the captured souls that have found themselves here. Once back at the Umbra tribe, Karisu makes herself at home and Solik is silently grateful. It's a shame we didn't get all this in the final game. Still, the restoration patch turns our dreams into a reality and allows us to help Solik, one of the best companions in the Fallout universe. Thank you to Daddy Harambe and Euro from the Discord server for suggesting this one. Also, make sure to check the links in the description to join the server yourself or to follow me on apps like Twitter and Instagram. Fallout New Vegas is renowned for player choice and spoken dialogue, with many lines hidden behind certain stat and skill checks. We can find one in Freeside that some players may miss due to the low intelligence required and because it's interlaced with Veronica's companion quest. We will need to speak to this vagrant to find the rangefinder Veronica is looking for. Typically, the NPC will mutter incoherently and not make much sense, even when you open his dialogue. <laughs> huh? Kids run by sometimes. With a low intelligence character, we can find some unique dialogue here. The Vagrant will now be speaking very well and with an enhanced vocabulary. Friend, not a few minutes ago, I chanced upon a pair of destitute orphans grappling over just such an item. If you cover the area methodically, I'm quite certain you'll happen upon them with only the most insubstantial of delays. Be well, and do try and avoid the tragic path of the sot that led me to my present infirmities and spiritual woes. Fare thee well. This is likely a callback to Fallout 2, where a low intelligence chosen one could get similar dialogue once they meet Tor and help the tribal guard his Brahmin from rad scorpion attacks. The dialogue will change to show that these two smooth brains can understand each other much more than someone with average or above average intelligence. This is peak Fallout humor, and moving forward with the series, I would love to see more dialogue changes based on intelligence stats. In Fallout New Vegas, some lost souls that we find in the Mojave can join the Courier on their wasteland adventures, like Veronica, a Brotherhood scribe with quite a storied history, and while she has an in-depth companion quest, I find her personal goal much more charming. If the Courier asks Veronica what she wants, the scribe will start gushing about pre-war dresses. I want... a dress. Yeah, a good one. Something elegant and classy, you know? But still stylish. Something that's eye-catching and sexy, but also says, don't fuck with me. I keep hoping I'll come across some old world designer gown when I'm scavenging, but it never happens. Maybe I should move back to California. 
Hey, you try getting a date wearing scribe robes. Might as well be wearing sweatpants. I just like them, you know? They make you feel like a woman. Those ladies before the war, they knew what they were doing. This starts the unmarked quest, You Make Me Feel Like a Woman, that involves finding a suitable dress for Veronica and placing it in her inventory. A few clothing items count for the quest, even Vera Key's gown from Dead Money. However, I only got Veronica to engage the final part of the quest with the formal wear. Once we place it in her inventory, Veronica will be beyond excited about the new fit and teach the courier the scribe counter unarmed perk, allowing a decent counter attack after blocking in combat. Do you mean it? No, no, it's too much. Well, okay, but it's too much. Oh, it's perfect. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I wish I had something to give you. I, wait, what about punching? That's the gift that keeps on giving. I could work on your punching with you, if you like. Show you how to counter like a scribe. All right, put him up. Let's see what you got. The perk is a great reward, but nothing beats how genuinely excited Veronica gets just to have a lovely dress to wear when she's roaming around the Mojave. Please assume the position. Uh, I gotta testify. Come up in the spot looking extra fly. For the day you die, you gon' trust the sky. You gon' trust the sky, baby girl. Looking extra fly for the day you die, yeah. you gon' 